Hello, Tom Cosm here. This is a continuation on from my recent modulation video about flanges, phasers, and chorus. We're going to be focusing on the phaser. It's one of my favorites. It's a very special effect. The way that the phasing happens is super unique. It's different to a flanger. It's different to a chorus. We'll be exploring why soon. We're going to be covering all pass filters. There's not a lot of information out there on how they work, but they're kind of nerdy and kind of cool. We're also going to be building one from scratch, and we'll be using some intermediate to advanced Ableton Live techniques. Let's jump in. I have an operator here and playing a sine wave, nice and smooth. And we have the Specky Scope. You can download this for free. The link is in the description. This is so we can see what we're doing. I'm going to choose a saw wave. So we have a lot of harmonics. And let's load up a phaser and do a very quick recap of how it works. So the signal comes in here and it gets split into two. One signal has a low pass filter, one has a high pass filter. The low and the high pass filters cutoff frequency is the same, they're synchronized. So if you were to move it up, the high pass would move up and cut out some low frequencies, but the low pass would open up and make up those frequencies. So nothing really changes. It's vice versa as well. If you move it down, the low pass will move down and cut high frequencies, but the high pass will move down and let through those frequencies that were lost. So that's an all pass filter. That's how an all pass filter works. But with a phaser, what we do is we phase shift one of those signals, in this case, the high pass filter signal. And that means we have the unphased signal mixing with a 50% phase shifted version of the signal. And this frequency here, this specifies where that happens. And you can see the peaks and the troughs here. This is the phased unphased signal getting mixed into the phase shifted signal. That is how a pole of a phaser works. We have multiple poles here, so this is just one, this is two, whoops, this is two, three, four, and we can move those around as well. The color determines how far and away and how close they are to each other. So out here the poles are far, we bring them in, they're close. We have a feedback which feeds the signal back into itself, kind of extenuates the frequency point. And we've got an envelope follower and an LFO. Um, I'm not sure if I'll cover these now. I won't go over them this second, but we might add them to the phaser that we build ourselves. Let's go ahead and do it now. I'm gonna delete the phaser here and let's, actually I'm gonna put a phaser on this audio channel. I've already got one, just as a reference. So let's build one. I'm gonna double click my operator to open it up. And we're gonna be using an EQ8 here. So I'm gonna turn off poles two, three, and four. We just want one pole and I'm gonna make it a four times low pass. I'm going to group this together into an audio effect rack and I'm going to name this chain low. I'm going to duplicate this chain, rename it high, and you might have guessed it, I'm going to change this to a four times high shelf. So we have a low and a high, low pass filter, high pass filter. Let's open up the macros. I'm going to map the frequency of the high pass filter to macro one, and I'm going to map the frequency of the low pass filter also to macro one. So now as I move this up, let's go to the high frequency chain. As I move this up, you'll see that the high pass is cutting off frequencies in the low end, but if I switch to the low, you'll see that this is made up for it. If I bring it down, the low pass is cutting them off, but the high is moved down as well. We can't see them at the same time, but that's what's happening, and we don't get a change in the sound until we add the phase shifting. I'm gonna do this with a utility. So I'm gonna drag a utility device after the high pass chain here, and I'm gonna turn on these two buttons, L and R. This phase shifts the signal by 50% on the left and the right. So the high pass is now phase shifted, the low pass is not. This determines where the non-phase signal and the phase signal hit each other, and let's have a look. Hopefully it sounds good. And you can see the frequency point there. So this is a very rudimentary phaser pole. This is how a phaser works, but we have multiple poles. So let's tackle that problem. I'm gonna rename this to pole. I'm gonna right click and turn this into an audio effect rack. And we'll just call this one. I'm gonna duplicate it, call it two. Duplicate it again, three, and we'll do four poles. So one more duplication, four. Uh, these are gonna be quite loud. So I'm gonna bring them down to negative 12 dB. And at the moment, they're not really gonna be doing anything spectacular. What we need to do is we need to be able to move the frequency of each of these four poles individually. Now, one way we could do that is we could just map them to the macro. So there's four, uh, three, two, and one. And this won't do anything special because they're all exactly the same. But we could go into our mapping and we could do things like we could bring the max down here, 
the min up here. So we're just kind of giving each one of these poles their own min and max range. This is very, very rough, but just to give you an idea of a multi-pole uh, makeshift homemade phaser, let's try it now. So you can see the separate poles moving around there. They're not very correct though. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna unmap these, remove, remove, remove and remove. I wanna use a multi-map. So a multi-map is a Max for Live device. If you do not have it in your um, Max for Live area, you can go to your PAX area and it is available as the Max for Live Essentials. It's free. After you download it and install it, you'll have a multi-map. A multi-map allows you to move one parameter and change eight different parameters all at once. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm going to open up my uh, pole here, my first pole, and I'm gonna map the frequency to that. I'm gonna map this one to the second pole, this one to the third pole, and this one to the fourth pole. Now this is kind of similar to uh, assigning it to that macro knob. You see as I move the input, we've got the pole moving here, but now we can kind of spread these out a bit more evenly because we're working with a percentage. So I'm gonna go, let's go 30, 40, 50, and 60, and let's go up 20 to 50, 60, 70, and 80. So pole one is gonna sweep from 30% to 50, pole two is 40% to 60, etc. So I'm going to close this down and look at the Spikiscope again. Very good. So that's poles. Mm. Now I'm just thinking about the color, what I want to emulate here. Let's focus on the feedback for a second. I can't really feed it back into itself. So what I'll do for the feedback is in our audio effect rack here, in our poles, I'm going to where are we here, low pass. We're getting deep with the racks here. What I wanna do is I will assign the Q, which is this one here, to the macro number two. And I'm gonna have to do this for all of them. I'll speed this part of the video up. Okay, so I've mapped the eight different EQ8s resonance to the second macro in their respective audio effect rack. And now I need to go ahead and map each one of these to a macro. So we have the resonance of the first pole, we'll map it to two. The resonance of the second pole, we'll map it to two. And three to two. Again, we just want one dial to control all of the resonances of those poles. Very good, and now if we bring this up, we get much more of an accent. So this is with no resonance, and this is with a lot. So this is going to do me for the feedback for this one. Uh, let's, okay, let's talk about spreading the poles out using a color. This is going to be a bit of a tricky one. What I'm going to do is I'm going to use another multi-map here. So let's drag it down and I'm going to assign each eight of these parameters to the min and the max of these four. Remember these four specify the frequency range of the sweepable value of those poles. So I'm going to map one to min one two to min two, three to min three, four to min four. Now we're gonna do five to max one, five to max two, five to max three, and five to max four. Okay, I'm going to set these at, we'll go, we'll start at 40, and I'm gonna keep these all exactly the same, just for now, the min and the max the same, just so we make sure we haven't run into any problems, because if we move on and go ahead, it would be hard to problem solve. So 55, 55. I'm going up in increments of five here as well. For the max value, I want it to be 20. So 40 plus 20 is 60. And then 65, 70, and 75. So at the moment, if I move this input, you'll see that these mins and max don't change at all because we've got the same for each individual parameter. Uh, let's just double check that sounds good. So we'll close this down, we'll close this down and play a note. Uh, we need to be moving this multi-map. Very good, and uh, if I bring this up, it's the same sound, okay. But now I need to change the max values of these. What I'm gonna do here, um, 
I'm gonna make this one go down to 20. So as I move this up, this one's gonna go down to 20%. I'm gonna make this one 35. So this one is 40 minus 20. This one is 45 minus 10. I'm going 20 uh, minus 20, then minus 10. This one needs to be, be plus 10, and this one needs to be plus 20. Now the reason I've done that is because I want the lowest one to go down further more exponentially than I, the second to lowest one goes down. So negative 20, negative 10, plus 10, plus 20. My maths isn't perfect here, but this will do in the meantime. For the max values, uh, I want this to go to 40. So again, negative 20. This one to go to 55, that's negative 10. Uh, 70 to, uh, wait, do I want this one to go to 70? This one goes 65, 65, 70 to 80, yep, and then this one is 75 to 95. So again, we have negative uh, 20, negative 10, plus 10, and plus 20. Now, as I move this multi-map, you'll see that all the mins and the max changes. And hopefully what should happen is they should separate those poles out from each other and we'll be able to see that by moving this around. Um, what I'll do here is, just to make things easier, is I'm going to group these, I'm going to group all of these together apart from the speaky scope into an instrument rack so we can start assigning master macros. So we'll go group, now we have an instrument rack, open up my macros, I'm going to map the this one to macro one, this is the frequency, we're in all caps, that's not good, frequency, uh, that'll do. I'm going to map, where are we here, this one here, which is the resonance, remember this is how extenuated the, um, the cutoff point is, so click on that, and map it to macro two, and we'll just call this res, and let's map this one, to macro three, this is color, or how far apart the poles are from each other. Hopefully this will work. So I'm gonna close these down so we can see, and let's look at the specky scope. So let's move the frequency around. We'll move the resonance up so we can really see them in the spectrogram. And now let's move the color up. And you'll see the poles move away from each other. Bring the color down. Now that's not perfect, that's not exactly how this works, there's a lot of bad math that I've done here, but that's to give you an idea of how you could go about it. Let's have a look here, uh, well, let's change the, let's add an LFO, that's an easy one, so in the max for live folder we also have an LFO, again comes with the uh, Ableton Live Essentials, I'm going to put it here next to the multi-map. Okay. Okay, I fixed that up. I accidentally replaced a multi-map with an LFO and it wouldn't let me backtrack. So let's go ahead and try that again. I'm going to put an LFO before this multi-map here. And I'm going to map the... I'll map it to the frequency. And we will map the depth to macro 4. And we'll map the rate to macro 5. Like so. Uh, depth, yeah. I will do rate to macro 5 like so. So now we have an LFO which we can turn on with the depth and the rate and it moves the frequency around. Uh, I'm just going to rename these to LFO depth and LFO rate. Very good. We can also emulate the envelope follower fairly easily or the envelope. Uh, we have an envelope follower max for live device here. Um, again, I'm just going to put this before the LFO. It doesn't matter where it goes. It doesn't affect the audio signal And you'll see as it gets a signal it draws a line for us And what we can do is map that particular line again to the frequency We do need to stop the LFO from attaching itself to the frequency and give the envelope follower a go So we'll go there and you'll see that this will move up uh, the envelope follower has a attack release and an amount so the amount is how much attack and release is applied when it receives a signal and that's attached to the frequency like we've done here so the rise and the fall in the envelope follower are basically your attack and your release so if I bring the rise up you'll see the line will move uh, a bit more uh, slowly gives it some attack and the fall we're not going to get any result out of the fall until I add a bit of a tail. So I'm going into my amp envelope of my saw oscillator and I'm going to give it some release time. So when I let go of the key, it continues playing. 
and that will allow us to change the full amount in the envelope follower. So if I bring this up, see how it lingers around and takes a while to disappear. If I bring this really short, it cuts off. If I bring the rise right down, very good. So let's map the, uh, we'll map the gain to the macro six and this will be env amount. Uh, we'll map the rise to macro seven, which is the env attack or env attack. And macro eight is the fall. So we will at attach it to that. So that's the env, uh, what do we have? Decay or release, okay, env release. Very good. So that's our eight macros all taken up, uh, which is slightly annoying because I want one more. Let me just get rid of the frequency mapping from the envelope follow so I can change it myself. What I want to have, the last thing I want to try to replicate is this poles knob here. So we can choose how many poles we have. We can't do it exactly how Ableton have done it with their phaser here, but we have four poles. And what I can do is look at this instrument rack here and you'll see we have pole one, two, three, and four. I can map these two a macro. So I'm going to map the mute of pole one to macro three, pole two, macro three, macro three, and macro three. And I'm going to bring the min values down. So this one is going to be one, this one's going to be two, this one's going to be three, and this one's going to be four. So that means as I move this up, you'll see that none of these are now enabled. They're all muted. As I bring it up, this will come on. Two, we've got two poles. Three, we've got three. Four, we've got four. Let's just make sure that we can see that in our spectrogram. No poles. So zero is no poles. Not very useless, uh, useful, but there we go. Now the problem here is that this goes all the way up to 127 and we only want it to go from, let's actually fix this. I want this to be zero, one, two, and three. So all we need is this to go from zero to three. Uh, the way I would tackle this <laughs> is to put it into one more effect rack. Uh, we'll group it together like so. And I'm gonna map this macro. We should change this to poles. I'm gonna map this macro to macro three and I'm gonna change the max value to three. So that will mean we can only move this up to three. So we've got a knob now, we can do a full sweep to open up the poles. And even though I'd like to have nine macros in this one, we don't have it. So we have to stick to one over here. All right, let's put the LFO back on to the frequency here. Let's make it nice and slow. And let's throw a reverb on it just for fun. Because a reverb at the end is always a treat. Here we go. Very good. So that is Tom Cosm's hack makeshift way of botching together a phaser from scratch, mainly to show you the signal flow, how the your password filters work, how the poles work, how the phasing sound is created, because it's, it's not something that's really covered. People just plug a phaser in and they know the sound, they know what it does, but they don't know how it works. Flanges and choruses, they're kind of easy to get your head around, but phasers, very interesting stuff. This is part of an In Case You Missed It series that I'm doing on things that are often overlooked in Ableton Live. I'm revisiting a lot of old things that I think I've personally mastered because when I do that, I tend to find new and interesting ways. I poke and prod them and rip them apart and do things that I'm not supposed to and it often leads to uh, newfound discoveries of stuff I already thought I knew. So like, subscribe, all that stuff if you like this kind of thing. Have a great day. My name's Tom Cosm.